About a month after Rabbi Sachs passed away, uh, Joanna ben Arosh spoke to us last night. Um, Rabbi, Jack, Rabbi Sachs' staff was kind enough to sit with me for an hour for the Zoom to visit with me as I worked through my own grief. Over the 30 years that Rabbi Sachs had mentored me, there was always a question I had long felt to ask her. I felt that it would be appropriate to do so during his lifetime. Now, here we were. He said to her, how did he work with and manage his research assistants? Joshua said, there were no research assistants. He did all the reading and retrieval on his own. I pondered that and then followed up, well, then there must be extensive files on his computer of notes from all that reading. No, she said, I don't know if he ever took notes. You had to see his books. They were full of dog-eared pages and sticky books. So I would like today to examine how Rabbi Sachs assimilated and grappled with one of those dog-eared pages. Because he referenced it at least a half dozen times in the last decade of his life. The book in question has a tantalizing title. The Fourth Forgiveness by the American classicist David Constant. Constant makes a bold claim that what we need today when we speak of asking for forgiveness, granting forgiveness, is nowhere found in Greek and Roman classical literature, and in fact is a relatively modern notion. So let's lay out what Constant means by this surprising claim. Let's begin by listing the elements that constitute what we routinely think of when we think of forgiveness. I'm going to call this the process of moral transformation. It entails a set of actions and dispositions by the offender and also by the victim. The offender should engage in introspection and realize that he has done wrong. He should verbally accept responsibility for what he did in the presence of the victim. He should express regret for the pain and damage he has inflicted on the victim. And finally, he should commit to changing his ways in the future. <coughs> for his part, the victim should recognize the moral transformation the offender has undergone and renounce bitterness because the offender is now a changed person. Through his moral transformation, the offender has earned forgiveness. Forgiving entails a performative act in which the former victim expresses his forgiveness to the offender. And critically, the victim should offer forgiveness solely on the basis of the moral transformation he sees in the offender. There should be no demand for compensation, public humiliation, or personal retribution. By contrast, Constant notes, in classical literature, when one party injures another, what is called for may be termed the restoration of status and honor. Here we rarely see an offender engage in introspection. There is little acceptance of responsibility for the pain caused or admission of wrongdoing. Figures in this literature offer no expression of regret or remorse. There is no value placed on the process of moral transformation by the offender. Instead, the offense is a slight to the status of the victim. And this is what must be restored. The offender must engage in self-abasement, self-humiliation before the victim. A supplicant may say something like, I willingly submit to your authority. I humble myself to you and ask submissively that you not use your authority to harm me. I value our relationship and recognize your superiority. Here, as opposed to what happens in moral transformation, offenders will resort to excuses. My family was hungry. That's why I stole from you. This is not to evade responsibility, but to make it clear to the offended party that the offense was not motivated out of a desire to disrespect the victim, but rather the difficult circumstances at hand. The process of moral transformation is intuitive for us because we live in an egalitarian society. The ethos of all men are created equal is axiomatic for us. And thus, when offense or injury is committed, we are nearly blind to thinking about the issue in terms of the, rel the relative status of the parties. Existentially, we are all equals. But in the hierarchical worlds of Greece and Rome, status is a cherished commodity. Offenses between individuals upset that balance. The Four Forgiveness was published in 2010, and thereafter Rabbi Sachs referred to it in at least a half dozen writings and occasions. Using Constant's dichotomy between moral transformation and the restoration of honor and status, 
Rabbi Sachs frequently contrasts two stories of reconciliation in the book of Genesis. On the one hand, reconciliation between Jacob and Esau, and that between Joseph and his brothers on the other hand. In both stories, the offended party, Esau and Joseph respectfully, renounce bitterness and forego retribution against the offender. But the processes for Rabbi Sachs are fundamentally different. When Jacob encounters Esau, Rabbi Sachs maintains, Esau is mollified because his status has been restored, not because of a moral transformation on the part of Jacob. In that story, nowhere does Jacob express what he did to Esau, how he feels about it now, what steps he will take in the future. Instead, the episode is one grand expression of Yaakov's self-abasement and humiliation designed to appease Esau. He sends elaborate gifts, refers to Esau as my lord, and to himself as your servant, and prostrates himself seven times before his older brother. This brings me to Constance's comments concerning the recon reconciliation between Joseph and his brothers and Rabbi Sachs's appropriation of Constance's work for his own elucidation of that story. All of us have marveled at Rabbi Sachs' capacity to draw from an incredibly wide range of academic disciplines. But what is less obvious is that to make academic arguments accessible and inspiring for the wider public, Rabbi Sachs often had to forego some of the nuance and complexity of his original academic sources. Tracing his use of Constance's observations concerning the Joseph story is a window into that process and the imperatives that governed it. As noted, Constant reviews accounts of reconciliation in classical literature and finds no processes of moral transformation, as laid out here earlier, and finds only processes of restoring honor and stature. Moving, uh, uh, moving on from classical literature, he then notes, almost as an aside, <coughs> he puts it, almost as an aside, that, quote, the Hebrew Bible is not without examples of personal forgiveness and recounts the account of reconciliation between Joseph and his brothers in Genesis 50. Yet note how Rabbi Sachs, uh, note how Rabbi Sachs incorporates this idea in a covenant and conversation essay. He opens by citing the reconciliation account of Joseph and his brothers. I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt, and now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. It was not you who sent me here, but God. And to this, he immediately cries, this is the first recorded moment in history in which one human being forgives another. Now, based on what Constant had written, this is not an overstatement, as Constant finds. No accounts in classical literature of forgiveness in the sense of moral transformation outlined above. Constant had mentioned that the Joseph story as an aside, but Rabbi Sachs goes to town with it. We see here a primary imperative that governs how Rabbi Sachs assimilates ideas from his academic sources. And it's what I would call grandstanding for Judaism. Rabbi Sachs will always seize the opportunity to demonstrate how the ethics of the Torah shine in comparison with the prevailing views at the time. But there is a second pedagogic goal that is achieved by broad statements such as the one that we have here on the screen. With apologies to my rabbinic colleagues here, sermons about the virtues of forgiveness, and forgive me for saying this, uh, can be rather dull. Um, we all intuitively grasp what forgiveness is about and why it's important. But when Rabbi Sachs shares with us that forgiveness actually has a history, that there was something else, quote, before forgiveness, his writing suddenly becomes not only uplifting, but fascinating, and therefore even more inviting. Now, Constant makes two additional comments about the Joseph story that Rabbi Sachs omits in his writing, and it is here where we see how he makes the accommodations necessary for his lay audience at the expense of some degree of comprehensiveness and nuance found in his academic sources. In the first comment, Constant notes a fact that will astonish many here. The biblical word for forgive, salah, or slicha, appears 49 times in the Tanakh. But in all cases, it is within the context of God and man, either when a human agent asks God for forgiveness or when God grants forgiveness to a human agent. There are no instances in the Tanakh where one person asks slicha of another person. And there are no instances in the Tanakh where a person grants slicha to another, using that term, 
including in the, in the story of Joseph and his brothers. Now, to adequately address this point, Rabbi Sachs would have needed to delve into philology and the inner workings of biblical Hebrew, an exercise not well suited for a piece for a general audience. And so, although he frequently cites Constance's observation about the Joseph story, uh, that the Joseph story contains elements of forgiveness that are not found in Greek and Latin literature, he makes no mention of uh, Constance's note, that, that the surprising note of the context of the word slicha in any of his writings. But we can, however, see an oblique reference to this issue. Joseph forgave. That was a first in history. Yet the Torah hints that the brothers did not fully appreciate the significance of his words. After all, he did not explicitly use the word forgive. He told them not to be distressed. He said, it is not you but God. He told them their act had resulted in a positive outcome. That is why the Torah recounts a second event years later after Jacob had died. The brothers sought a meeting with Joseph, fearing that he would now take revenge. They concocted a story. They sent words to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers for the sins and the wrongs they committed. The Hebrew, Sana Fesha Achecha in treating you so badly. Now, pl now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. What they said was a white line, but Joseph understood why they said it. The brothers used the word forgive, this is the first time it appears explicitly in the Torah, because they were still unsure about what Joseph meant. And so even though, according to Rabbi Sachs, the Torah does not use the term really slow up uh, uh, to describe their request, Rabbi Sachs finds a synonym for it, and more on that in a moment. Constant raises a second point about the Joseph story that Rabbi Sachs likewise chooses to omit. To illustrate the point, imagine that you are dismissed from your place of work on unjust grounds. If you remain out of work for a long time, you are likely to harbor great resentment over your mistreatment. But imagine a situation where you quickly find new employment, and that your new position is more remunerative and rewarding in every imaginable way. Your firing, it turns out, was a blessing in disguise. Here, you are far less likely to harbor resentment, since it was the very injustice of you being fired that opened the door of opportunity. Constant notes that Joseph's forgiveness of the brothers occurs under highly specific and unusual circumstances. The brothers had surely perpetrated an injustice on Joseph, but in the end, their injustice was instrumental to his rise and success. So under such circumstances, how are we to assess the forgiving attitude of the former victim, Joseph? Can forgiveness under such circumstances serve as an inspirational model, model for normal cases where the offense only leads to the detriment of the victim? Although Constant raised this issue, Rabbi Sachs makes no mention of it. To do so, metaphorically speaking, would be to let the air out of the balloon of Joseph as a model for forgiveness, and thereby subvert Rabbi Sachs' pedagogic aims. In his discussion of interpersonal forgiveness in the Hebrew Bible, Constant mentions only the story of Joseph, and with good reason. There are indeed in the Bible several accounts of interpersonal rupture and repair, such as Yaakov and Esau, Judah and Tamar, Chana and Abu the high priest. But the Joseph story is the only one where there is speech between the characters that seems to even approximate the process of what we would call asking for and receiving forgiveness. This leads Rabbi Sachs to speculate on this surprising observation. He says, why then is there so little reference to interpersonal forgiveness in the Bible? And the reason is that the Bible is a book, a library of books, about the relationship between God and human beings. It's about <coughs> heaven and earth, divine command and human response. It's not primarily about interpersonal relationships at all. Once the Torah has established the principle of human forgiveness in Joseph's story, as it does here in the Joseph narrative, it does not need to repeat it. Now, Rabbi Sachs is correct to note that interpersonal forgiveness is not a topic oft found in the Hebrew Bible. For Rabbi Sachs, this is because the Bible focuses on the relationship between God and man, not man and his fellow man. But I, reverently and respectfully, would argue otherwise. Interpersonal forgiveness, as we know it, is absent from the Bible because it is absent from the ancient world, Israel included. We saw earlier that the word slicha is employed exclusively with regard to forgiveness between God and man. Rabbi Sachs translated the brother's call for, for here, sa na lefesha abadecha, as forgive your servant's sin. 
But examination of the phrase sa-fesha across the Tanakh suggests an implication other than forgive me. In all cases where individuals call sa-na-fesha, literally call for the sin to be lifted, it is always within the context of a commutation of a sentence, usually a death sentence. When the brothers explain, lift up the sin of your servant, sa-na-fesha, it is a call for clemency, a call to be spared. Indeed, scripture records that the proximate cause of their entry to Yosef was fear of reprisal on his part in the wake of Jacob's passing. This is quite different than the expression of regret and remorse for having done wrong that we normally equate <coughs> with asking for forgiveness in the sense of moral <coughs> transformation. To put things more starkly, we simply have no word in biblical Hebrew for interpersonal forgiveness. Even the term mechila is exclusive to rabbinic literature and nowhere found in the Bible. I would add likewise that the Bible knows no word for apology or to apologize. In fact, I would claim that the account of Joseph and his brothers in Genesis 50 seems to display the dynamics of restoring status and honor to the offended party quite well. This is, this is evident in the play of language between Joseph's own, own dreams at the outset of the story and the language employed, employed in Genesis 50 as the brothers reconcile with Joseph. Joseph. Here we find the light for it. Behold, in every phrase of, of the dream. This all emerges as highly significant when we arrive at the scene of reconciliation between Joseph and his brothers in Genesis 50. Here, the, judge, the brothers are not focused on remorse, but on begging for their lives. They realize that the key to their survival is to actualize what Joseph had envisioned in those dreams. Indeed, the brothers had already prostrated themselves before Joseph earlier in the narrative, but that was when he was known to them only as the viceroy of Egypt, and his identity as Joseph was hidden. Now, and for the first time, they bow before him as their brother Joseph in a gesture of self-abasement just as Joseph had told them they would in his dreams. Thus, on many accounts, we may question whether the, Joseph, the story of Joseph and his brothers is a true account of forgiveness as moral transformation of both offender and victim. To be sure, ancient Israel, like all cultures, at all times, had its protocols of how relationships heal from a state of rupture to a state of repair. But when we speak of forgiveness between Joseph and his brothers, or between any two parties in the Tanakh, these processes must be contextualized within the social worlds with which those individuals interact. Everywhere, at all times, individuals are embedded in a larger social world with differing notions of kinship, social mobility, class structure, and religious practice. The processes of forgiveness, therefore, may be different across cultures. We cannot open the Bible and expect it to mirror our own world. The culturally conditioned nature of reconciliation and forgiveness is a hot topic in the academy. In fact, in just two weeks' time, a conference with the title of the first international conference on forgiving and being forgiven within an intra-cultural perspective will be held right here at bar University in the ages of the Department of Criminology. Investigating how a broad range of cultures navigates the road from rupture to repair can provide us with a control and a vocabulary to better understand these dynamics within biblical literature. I conclude with one small example to demonstrate the potential. In Genesis 38, Judah wrongly accuses Tamar of having committed adultery, when in fact it was he who had impregnated her when she posed as a prostitute to ensnare him. Close of the story, Judah receives damning evidence from Tamar that he had impregnated her. Impregnated her. Jo Joseph, uh, Judah, Judah claims, he, he explains, she is more righteous than I. But notice the dynamics here are far removed from how we think of forgiveness and how it works. We might well say that Judah should apologize to her personally. Not an exclamation, she is more righteous than I, except commonly, but a direct address to her. You are more right than I. The text is silent about Tamar's reaction. We might have expected Tamar to be magnanimous and declare her willingness to forgive him, having seen his contrition. But I would claim that the dynamics between Yudan and Tamar are best understood when the story of reconciliation is read through the lens of an honor culture. As laid out by Julian Pitt Rivers and his followers, in such a culture, the value of a person in his or her own 
rise is largely a function of their value in the eyes of their social group. Here, the court of public reputation means large. When Judah's messengers inform him that he has been unable to find the harlot that he slept with, and has been able, unable to retrieve the personal items he left with her, Judah panics. Let her keep what she has, or we will become a laughingstock, he cries, fearing that she will let him out, thus diminishing his status in the court of public reputation. Given this, we can well understand the story's conclusion. In this honor culture, Tamar is not primarily interested in a personal apology from Judah, nor in an expression of remorse. She wishes for her honor to be upheld in the court of public reputation, in the court of public reputation. Judah's public declaration, she is more right than I, is exactly what is called here and satisfies her fully. I end, as I began, with a personal note. Early in my academic career, I read Rabbi Sachs' work on the Torah's political manifest, Radical Ben, Radical Mary. From an academic perspective, I saw so much potential, but he wrote that his work sparked for me what became a monograph on the subject. The same is here true now. I would never have known that there was a field called forgiveness studies without reading Rabbi Sachs' invocation of Constance's book and his explication of Joseph's story. And now, for the second time in my career, comments by Marie Garabi Rabbi Sachs are serving for me as a trigger for a book-length project. My comments today are the initial musings in a forthcoming book entitled Without Apology, Without Forgiveness, The Restoration of Relationships in the Hebrew Bible. Thank you very much.